Welcome to Mycotoxin Analysis, a tool for FSMA compliance. My name is Dr. Cassie Jones, and I'm an associate professor at Kansas State University. I've also served as the editor for the Food Safety Preventive Controls Alliance training material on the preventive controls for animal food, which is training material that's being utilized to train FDA investigators, industry, and academics on the concepts of FSMA's preventive controls for animal food rule. When we think about the Food Safety Modernization Act, or FSMA, we understand that there are a variety of, of different types of rules associated with it. And specifically, mycotoxins can have impacts in a number of these different rules. We're primarily going to be focusing on animal and human food today. When we think about the Food Safety Modernization Act, we understand that the premise of the rule is to first identify sources of where hazards could be introduced. So for example, are hazards being introduced from the environment, from the equipment, from ingredients, people, or even process design? And the second part of FSMA is to identify potential mitigation points for those hazards to allow us to prevent them from occurring in the first place. And so for that reason, prerequisite programs, some of which might be current good manufacturing practices, as well as preventive controls can be employed to help minimize any occurrence of these hazards within the finished product. The preventive controls for animal food rule 21 CFR 507 has a specific section that discusses uh, mycotoxins in their current good manufacturing practice requirements. And so again, these are actions or items that are being used to prevent mycotoxins in the, in the finished product. And this is a regulatory requirement that states raw materials and other ingredients susceptible to contamination with mycotoxins or other natural toxins must be evaluated and used in a manner that does not result in animal food that can cause injury or illness to animals or humans. Now, when I read that sentence, my first inclination was thinking, wow, FDA expects us to test every load with myco for mycotoxins, every load of grain or, or other ingredients susceptible to mycotoxin. But as you dig into the rule, that's actually not what FDA was intending. The preamble of the Preventive Controls for Animal Food Rule actually clarifies this, where FDA goes on to describe that the term evaluation does not directly mean testing. And in fact, they state, not every load needs to be tested. Other forms of evaluation are acceptable ways for, for evaluating animal food. So for example, we can consider weather considerations. So I frequently rely on Neogen's um, Monday morning report to evaluate and understand what levels of mycotoxins are occurring in different types of grains throughout, throughout different growing conditions or different geographic areas where I'm sourcing ingredients from. And that can be considered as one of this evaluate, evaluation metrics. I can also consider specific supplier considerations, the role of any unusual visual residues, or a number of variety of other things. And all of those can be um, brought in and considered as part of this evaluation metric. So the second part outside of current good manufacturing practice is to have and understand the role of mycotoxins within a food safety plan and understand if they need a preventive control. To really understand and make the best decision about that, we first have to spend just a touch of time understanding what some of this terminology means as it relates to hazards and some of the FSMA language. So when we think first about mycotoxins, the first question we ask ourselves during hazard, hazard identification and evaluation is, does the agent, in this case mycotoxin, have the potential to cause illness or injury in humans or animals? And of course, with mycotoxins, we would consider yes. And so it would be what we call a hazard. So it's, it's a food safety hazard. Yes, it, it's there, it exists, and it has the potential to cause illness in, in both humans and animals. So then the second question is, is that hazard associated with either the facility or the type of animal food? Well, if my facility is bringing in ingredients or raw materials that are susceptible to mycotoxin, then that answer is yes. Furthermore, if my facility is manufacturing, processing, packing, or holding a type of animal food that is um, the food for, for that animal, uh, and, and that animal could be susceptible to mycotoxins, then yes, that would also be true. And so if one or both of those are accurate, which in many cases they are, 
then that hazard would then be known as a known or reasonably foreseeable hazard. The final question that we ask ourselves during hazard evaluation is if that hazard is both severe and probable. And this is where it gets tricky. Many times mycotoxin or mycotoxicosis can be pretty severe, but are there some things that we can do, such as having a mycotoxin monitoring program to reduce the probability? Even with those pieces in place, if the mycotoxin presence is both severe and probable in the finished product, in that case, it would be a hazard requiring a preventive control. Even then we have options, preventive controls could address the control at supplier levels, which would be a supply chain applied control. We could control that ourselves through designated um, testing and holding protocols, for example. Those would be process controls, or we could employ sanitation or other controls, which are other types of preventive controls. Or we could push that downstream onto our customer through a specific provision um, that's maybe not exactly pertinent for this case, but there is this option within the Food Safety Modernization Act through 507.36. But in most cases, when we're thinking about mycotoxins, it really comes down to considering, yes, we understand that mycotoxins are known or reasonably foreseeable hazards, but are they probable enough to be hazards requiring a preventive control? And that's where we can consider the role of prerequisite programs. This is um, a, an excerpt from our um, Food Safety Preventive Controls Alliance Preventive Controls for Animal Food course training material in our manual. And again, this is the manual that's being trained or being used to train both industry as well as FDA investigators. And the excerpt or section from that, from that manual states, a facility should consider whether an effective prerequisite program such as current good manufacturing practice reduces the probability that a known or reasonably foreseeable hazard may occur. This consideration may result in the facility determining that based on the overall hazard analysis, a variety of these different options. So first, maybe that prerequisite program sufficiently reduces the probability so it's known or reasonably foreseeable, but not a hazard requiring a preventive control. Second, maybe it reduces the probability, but not enough. And so the hazard is both known or reasonably foreseeable and requires a preventive control. But potentially the prerequisite program is the pre preventive control itself. Or finally, potentially even with that prerequisite program in place, it might still need another additional preventive control. Regardless of how this is set up, and this is where it, where it becomes really important, is that the prerequisite program must effectively be implemented to reduce the probability. And thus it should have procedures and routine record keeping in place that are, that are a good industry practice. So what this is really saying is that there's not an expectation from FDA to create a bunch of preventive controls to manage mycotoxins. Their interest is to make sure that food is safe at the end of the day. You can choose to do that by creating preventive controls. Unfortunately, formal preventive controls have a fair amount of paperwork and verification and validation requirements that in many cases are above and beyond what's truly necessary to make sure that's, that food is safe at the end of the day. Instead, what I see a lot of facilities doing is implementing pretty substantial prerequisite programs for mycotoxin monitoring. And by implementing those, they have confidence that they're sufficiently reducing the probability so that they have a known or reasonably foreseeable hazard, but it's not a hazard requiring a preventive control. In that sense, they're alleviated from the substantial record keeping requirements. So what does this really look like? Well, this is just a quick example, and it's in the same format as the Preventive Controls for Animal Food Rule training material is from, food, from the Food Safety Preventive Controls Alliance, but you certainly could format this differently. But the food safety plan really is just identifying and evaluating hazards as part of the hazard analysis system. So we're going to walk through this. The first columns, which are in blue, is all about hazard identification. And so the first would be to identify an ingredient or a processing step. And in this case, just for our example, we're going to identify grain products. And for those grain products, we would identify any potential, any known or reasonably foreseeable biological, physical, or chemical hazards. Well, in column two, 
we know that mycotoxins are a chemical hazard, that's a C, and that chemical hazard is known or reasonably foreseeable in grain products. They're certainly associated with them. So then we have to think about, for these mycotoxins in grain products, what's the severity of that hazard if it were to get into the finished product? Well, we have data scientifically that shows us that mycotoxins within animal feed can impact both animal and human health. And so we evaluated that and listed it as a two, which is a moderate level of risk. Now, the second question or the second part of that evaluation is the probability in column four. What is the probability of those mycotoxins occurring in the absence of a preventive control? And I like to kind of list this out in terms of frequency. Is this going to occur annually, monthly, daily, or hourly? And so we actually have C, which is low. Um, maybe A would be high, B moderate, C low, and D would be very low. And so we have the probability listed as C or low, and that gives us an overall risk of 2-C meaning that we were medium or moderate for severity, we were low for probability. So in column five, the overall evaluation of that risk of mycotoxins and grain products was moderate. So the final question is, does the hazard require preventive control? Does this combination of severity and probability warrant or require a preventive control? Well, in this facility's case, they determined no and this is their justification. So column seven is the justification, and this is really the key and important part. They, de they, they described that weather-related issues um, are, or mycotoxins are a weather-related issue, and that is monitored and tested for accordingly. Mycotoxin levels are tied closely to regional growing conditions, and the standard operating procedure in place ensures appropriate monitoring and testing, and it refers to Appendix 3. I'm actually going to show you an example of that here in a moment. And so specifically in the justification, they have a separate reference document, but they're stating that the reason this is not a hazard requiring a preventive control is that it, we are using a prerequisite program to lower the probability of this from occurring. If that's the case, in columns eight and nine in that prevention, we have not applicable because there is no preventive control associated with that because we determined it didn't need one. So that said, what does this prerequisite program look like? Because again, as we talked about earlier, we should have some type of formal program with a good industry practice of both written expectations for how this program is going to be completed, as well as some documentation. And I have no problem sharing that documentation with FDA to demonstrate to them that I am actively engaged in this prerequisite program. But again, it doesn't have to meet the two-year record-keeping requirements um, that some of the official requirements would be if it were a preventive control. So my prerequisite program would include written procedures for sampling. Things like, how frequently should I sample? How much quantity should I collect? How am I going to collect it and what equipment am I going to use? A lot of those different types of questions. And so I would use a mycotoxin sampling and testing SOP that probably has threshold levels. So for example, I'm going to rely on the Neogen weekly report on a weekly basis, as well as some composite samples to understand if I am in a low, medium, or high risk for mycotoxins this growing season. And based on that, I'm going to potentially increase or decrease my sampling frequency up to the point that I'm sampling every load, down to the point that I'm sampling composite samples on a weekly basis, really depending upon geographic constraints and growing conditions um, from where I'm sourcing that material from. Second, I'm going to include written procedures for if I collect this sample, how am I going to prepare it and how am I going to analyze it? And then finally, the documentation, which is the one that's furthest on, on the right. When and how am I going to analyze this? Did I follow the SOP? What was the grain type and the tested level? Did I receive or reject that grain? What's the resultant risk level? Any notes and the initials of a qualified individual, someone who has documented training to do that activity and be conducting that analysis appropriately.
So this is how I would formalize my mycotoxin monitoring program. I think that this is a good method to be monitoring mycotoxin risk over time, over an annual basis, and really be able to use scientific justification for why or why not mycotoxins might be a hazard requiring a preventive control within your facility. So the take-home messages for today include that the Food Safety Modernization Act requires mycotoxins to be evaluated in ingredients. It is a requirement of the Preventive Controls for Animal Food Rule, specifically in the CGMP section. Second, we know that mycotoxins are frequently a known or reasonably foreseeable hazard, and therefore they should be addressed in food safety plans. Facilities are going to address these in a variety of, other, uh, uh, in a variety of ways. For some facilities, it will make sense to have a program that samples and waits for the results of an analysis of a, analysis of a quick test before they can begin unloading. For other facilities, that's just not something that, that can be managed. And so it's really facility dependent. But a mycotoxin monitoring program can address both of the above to help lower the hazard's probability and finished product. But if you're using a mycotoxin monitoring program, it really should include written procedures and methods, appropriate training of personnel, and documentation of your efforts that you're willing to show FDA upon inspection. If you have questions, feel free to email me at jonesc at ksu.edu, and I wish you good luck in this growing season.